Hello and welcome to News Click. Today we have with us with our COVID discussions, Dr. Satyajit Rath, and we are going to discuss the AstraZeneca results that have come in, which have claimed something like 70% efficacy with two sets of figures, one 60%, one 90%, somehow averaged to 70%. Satyajit, can you tell us a little bit about why we have two figures and uh, what is this 70% average we seem to have got out of that? So, um, this reminds me of the old uh, story of the man in prison who claimed that he was being tortured and uh, his captor said he's not being tortured average temperature he is held at is 30 degrees celsius uh, why is he complaining it's a different matter that uh, at one end of his body the temperature is uh, 90 degrees at the other end of his body the temperature is minus something degrees the average of course is 30 degrees celsius this is what's called the statistician's delight if your head is in the fridge and your feet are in, on an oven then you are comfortable exactly so uh, so we'll come back to that in a minute here is a little fairy tale that is being built around the um, and I, as you know, insist on this, around the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine candidate. <laughs> Since again, AstraZeneca is simply providing the money. Um, Sarah Gilbert, Andrew Pollard and their colleagues at Oxford University using public funds have spent decades establishing the adenoviral vector-based vaccine platform that's being used. Um, but here's the fairy tale that we are being told. And I'll explain why I'm calling it a fairy tale. Here's the fairy tale that we are being told. The fairy tale is that they started this clinical trial and they realized that they were getting, I think, I, I, I hope I'm getting this right. They realized that they were getting somewhat um, lower frequencies and more mild side effects, the immediate side effects of pain, of a little bit of fever for a day or two, um, not feeling well as a result of adenovirus vector-based vaccination. So they went back and examined and they realized that they had made a mistake in the trial. And that this first dose that had been given to some X number of people was actually only half the dose that had been planned. So rather than simply correcting it, they basically set up what amounted to two separate groups. One group got half of the planned dose as the first dose and four weeks later got a full normal what was planned as the second dose. Whereas a different group of volunteers got the full planned dose both as a first dose as in a second dose. Now here's the little catch. These uh, two digit, low three digit case number data that we've been seeing these past few days and weeks from um, BioNTech Pfizer, from Moderna, um, from the Malaya's Sputnik, um, which is even low double digit, and uh, now from, from um, Oxford AstraZeneca are being looked at in the Oxford AstraZeneca case in these two separately vaccinated groups, separately immunized groups. And lo and behold, there is a difference in the extent of protection 
between these two groups. And even more interestingly, lo and behold, the group that got the half of the planned dose as the first dose shows 90% protection. The group that got the actual planned dose both times is showing 62% protection. If, of course, you average across these, you get 70 something percent protection. So, a great deal of uh, um, server time, um, ink, paper, etc., has been spent on trying to provide a mechanism for this. What I would like us to think through is the reality that these are all small numbers, that, they, that the precise differences are likely to change as numbers accumulate. You know, it's a little bit like counting votes. We've just had elections both in the United States and in one of India's largest states, and we know what things look like as numbers are counted. So here, Satyajit, the quick interruption, that it also seems that the, the one with the small initial dose and the larger final dose or the normal final dose, actually the smaller sample, because if you average from 60 to 90, the numbers will say you'll get 75. So the fact that you got a different number which showed that was the smaller number. The 90% immunity is a smaller number of people. And effectively, it's quite possible that you are going to end up with maybe, if you did more trials, somewhere between 60 to 70. That's, that's a possibility. Statistically, that seems to be there, unless, as you were saying, that there is a mechanism which can explain why a small initial dose and 100% dose, planned dose later, 50% dose, 100% dose later, could actually work better than 200% dose. You are an immunologist. That's your specialization. Is there anything, though I've seen again, uh, reports of some, uh, uh, again, I presume or good, well-known practitioners saying this is possible, there could be mechanism. But do you think that that's a very likely case or it's just large numbers, as you were saying, once we have the bigger numbers, this will actually come down. So let me put it this way. If I were writing a grant proposal for funding, I would say, oh, of course, this is potentially significant. And the mechanism must be clearly understood. The first aim of my grant proposal would be, we will confirm whether this is the case or not. On the other hand, if I was reviewing such a paper that said, clearly there is a difference, and therefore a biological mechanism now must be operative, I would say, please acknowledge that this may simply be a coincidence. Artifact of statistics rather than a uh, biological reason why this uh, difference exists. The second issue, and I think that's a more important one, they've also claimed that the group which got the actual uh, vaccine and not the placebo, that none of them were hospitalized or seriously infected. Seriously infected. So would that also mean that, yes, that some of them did show infections, but the intensity of the infection, so to say, or the reaction was much less than what could be normally expected? Or is it also small numbers? So um, now we move into something that's, for me, even more interesting, because it's both um, mechanistically interesting scientifically interesting and politically interesting. It's scientifically interesting because while their numbers are small, they are not the only trial to have these small numbers of severe COVID-19 illness. In every one of the previous press releases, you will find a throwaway sentence that says exactly the same thing. Okay. 
Now, I ask us, if AstraZeneca is going to average between what are effectively two independent vaccine trials, what stops me from averaging across the BioNTech, Pfizer, the Moderna, and these two Oxford AstraZeneca trials add up all the severe COVID-19 cases in the placebo groups and in the actually vaccinated groups and say, tell us what the extent of protection against severe disease by any vaccine is. I can already hear howls of protest from statisticians, trialists, as uh, specialists call themselves, and so on and so forth. And then I turn around and I make the political point once again. Why, oh why, did we not all enroll all of these vaccine candidates in the WHO Solidarity Vaccine Trial, where we would have actually been able to do this comparison? Yes, that's something that we have discussed earlier as well. Again and again. Again and again. But this is what we've also discussed earlier. Capitalism, pharmaceuticals and health. This is the problem that we face. It's not a medical, it's not a public health problem. It's a social problem that we have. It's a political problem. It's a problem where we as a global society and community have allowed this myth of the open competitive marketplace to limit our response to COVID-19. Because by now, we would have had an answer about whether vaccination protects against severe disease or not. Which is an answer we still will have to aggregate the way you are doing across dissimilar trials. <laughs> Coming back to the other issue that also we had discussed this earlier, there, is, there are also the issues of infections taking place. Now the numbers of people who have infect, been infected twice has grown. And it does appear that it's quite possible that in a number of cases, the COVID-19 immunity would not last too long whether six months, one year, three months, these are different issues, but certainly lifelong immunity, no, and probably short duration immunity from six months to a year is possible. Beyond that, possibly no. Again, to be verified, these are only conjectures I'm making uh, or based on discussions we have had and whatever we are reading. So the herd immunity based on infections, the Boris Johnson Swedish hypothesis and also, I think there is in the United States, few doctors and epi epidemiologists have got together, have also issued a declaration to this effect. All this doesn't seem to be scientifically now true, or can be, very, can be held to be a possible way forward. So, and absolutely right. And it's interesting that you bring this up in the context of the, these emerging data with vaccine candidates, because inevitably a major conversation that's taking place around the, the success of these vaccine candidates is how much of a population would we need to vaccinate to reach vaccine-induced herd immunity? And that has brought back into the conversation all these issues of natural infection-based herd immunity. So let me, let me point out um, as, a, as an object lesson, a recent uh, um, analysis based on where I am, which is in Pune, um, and the zero survey from um, very small urban crowded localities in Pune that, uh, that some of my colleagues um, in the city have uh, been doing and have been analyzing these past few weeks and months that was just uploaded as a preprint. Now, the two interesting things about it. Firstly, there is the uh, statistician's stupidity that Pune was supposed to have a zero prevalence of 50%. And yet in the five very small micro localities surveyed, 
the prevalence varied from 35% to 70%. So averaging is stupid without context. But beyond that, here's the interesting piece of correlation that's embedded in that, in that um, paper, which directly addresses the herd immunity issue in an interesting way. And that is that the survey was done over a fortnight. In the month or so after that fortnight, what was the case number in each of these micro localities? And what is the correlation between the zero prevalence in these micro localities and the subsequent case numbers in these micro localities? There is clearly an inverse correlation. In other words, if the zero prevalence was high, the number of cases was low. If the zero prevalence was low, the number of cases was high. Two lessons. One, even with as high a zero prevalence as 70%, the number of cases was, to use a famous term from uh, Donald Trump's uh, uh, hotshot legal team, the number was non-zero. <laughs> Which means that the commonly understood notion of herd immunity, that you interrupt transmission and virus spread halts. I could argue plausibly that even at 70% zero prevalence, there was still transmission in the community. But number two, that more rationally, the more people were exposed, the slower was the spread of transmission. This is the kind of mundane, quantitative, struggle-based, coming to terms with an infectious disease pandemic that we need to acknowledge and deal with as reality. So that's, a, that's the good, good point to end this discussion with, that the seroprevalence studies show that A, that other point which you haven't said, but which I know you have made a number of times, that essentially you don't look at Pune as a whole. You have to look at pockets and each pocket behaves differently. The transmission is not taking place in a homogeneous entity called Pune, but amongst a set of people who live in different localities have different networks of contacts, different, you know, what is called different bubbles in today's language. And therefore, the transmission that takes place in this area is also dissimilar, apart from the fact that obviously the level of immunity that you have also slows down, but doesn't stop the infection from transmissions. And particularly if you have a city like Pune, forget about a country like India. If you have a city like Pune or a city like Delhi, then pockets of herd immunity is not going to stop the transmission of the disease or even spikes, which happened in Pune and is now happening in Delhi. So all of this shows that we are facing a situation where we need a vaccine. And that's a point I really wanted to come to, that if we want normal life to resume, Vaccine is something we would still require. That slow march towards herd immunity is not going to get us there. And that's the final lesson that we seem to be hearing from all of this. Good news still that if all the vaccines claim that in the trials, severity of the disease is lessened, even though people do fall sick, and even if the numbers of people falling sick reduced significantly, then we can say we have a successful vaccine. That success is not uh, that we'll eradicate the disease, but we'll be in control of it. So I think that's a positive note to end your discussion with. Any last remark on that before we close the discussion? No, I, I agree entirely. We should keep in mind that what all of this is telling us is that there is a long, protracted, multifaceted struggle that we need to deal with. Vaccine successes will simply give us additional useful instruments, not magic bullets. 
And for our viewers, I would like to end with this note that the AstraZeneca or what Satyajit called the Oxford AstraZeneca uh, vaccine has of course strong Indian uh, implications because Serum Institute has tied up with them and they are promising to start delivering to the market by possibly January. Market meaning, of course, hopefully the government and those who are really on the first line of the fight against COVID-19 are health workers. And hopefully we'll start seeing action on that count, depending on how the government and the central government, the state governments handle it. But it does seem that the Oxford AstraZeneca can be useful for India. Therefore, we have really more of an eye on it than the Moderna and the BioNTech, BioNTech Pfizer vaccine, which as we know, the kind of temperature requirements are not suitable. Oxford vaccine is 2 to 8 degrees. So this is something which is more easy to handle. We still have logistical issues because you have to transport, track people for the duration required. And also it is injectable, not an oral vaccine. And therefore there are additional uh, technical requirements uh, that are required, uh, that are there for delivering the vaccine. But hope as, as yet and hopefully by January we will see more action. Thank you Satyajit for being with us and taking us to this arduous uh, immunology route which we need to have to discuss vaccines. This is all the time we have today for News Click. Do keep watching News Click and also visit our website. Thank you.